Well, hey, what's up, everybody? Pastor Matt here. Thank you so much for checking into my YouTube channel. I'm fresh off a of beard trim yesterday. Hopefully, I look a little bit, a uh, little bit more professional, a little less Presbyterian, perhaps. But today, we're going to have uh, what I think is going to be a really fun episode. I've got on the line here my own ruling elder from our church here, Gospel Fellowship PCA, and my friend Nathaniel Sheets is here. We're going to talk about one of the Presbyterian greats from a generation or so ago, uh, J. Gresham Machen, or J. Gressel Machen. We'll get the official pronunciation here in just a second, but I uh, want to welcome you to my channel if you're new. Uh, my name is Matt, one of the pastors at Gospel Fellowship PCA. We're a Reformed church just north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you're anywhere in the area, we'd love to have you come worship with us on the Lord's Day. We have services right now at 8.30 in the morning and 11 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So if you know anybody near Pittsburgh, please come check us out. All right. Well, as mentioned, Nathaniel Sheets is here uh, to talk to us today. Now, Nathaniel is one of my ruling elders here, not currently on session, but we've been on session together before, Nathaniel. So uh, first question, what is it like to work with such a tyrant on the session as, uh, as yours truly for the senior pastor? What's that like? Oh, it's great. It's great to have uh, Pastor Matt's leadership, and but it's still, it's a big group of guys, uh, and uh, a lot of fun to uh, hear different ideas and uh, you know try to lead the church, lead the church well. And I think Pastor Matt does a great job of that. Oh, thank you, brother. Um, you know, speaking of flattering one another here, and I'm sorry <laughs> for that, that question. I didn't uh, didn't put that in the script. Um, I want to mention Nathaniel Sheets's YouTube channel. In fact, he's got a channel. And what's cool about Nathaniel, he has two channels, actually. One of them is in English, and then one of them is in Spanish. And he's putting up some really cool reformed content in both English and Spanish. And so in the description of this video, we're going to post a link to both of uh, Nathaniel's YouTube channels. So if you know anybody that speaks Spanish, and is interested in Reformed theology. I don't know how many people out there are doing this kind of thing, but but here's one of them right here, Nathaniel. So um, just to give the viewers a little introduction of who you are and where you came from and what you know about Machen, that kind of thing, just give us a little bit about yourself and maybe even plug your your channel, what you're doing over there at uh, on your page. Sure. So yeah, I grew up in a uh, non-denominational baptist -y church, so you wouldn't necessarily expect that I would have uh, known much about Machen uh, per se, uh, since he's a, a Presbyterian. Uh, but uh, in college, started going to Presbyterian churches and eventually made my way to Gospel Fellowship. Uh, got a wife and two kids um, and love being involved at Gospel Fellowship. Uh, being on session for a number of years, uh, being involved in presbytery when I can. Uh, my day job is uh, working for a software company. So between all that, I don't have as much time as I'd like for my for a YouTube channel. But um, but yeah, I enjoy uh, enjoy trying to learn things about Reformed theology, uh, particularly as they relate to my own life, uh, and then uh, and then writing some stuff, creating some content for, for YouTube. So, um, I do, so obviously the, the, the English and the Spanish, I'm a native speaker of English, but I've also studied Spanish for most of my life, uh, studied abroad in Mexico and, and try to do what I can. Um, the main, the main way that I use Spanish right now though, uh, is in teaching my kids Spanish. So mm -hmm. young children are learning uh, Spanish uh, and hopefully will be bilingual as they get older. So the Spanish channel gives me an outlet for, uh, working on my Spanish, uh, and also, uh, specifically the, the theology side of things so that, uh, maybe it'll be useful to people right now. Uh, maybe it'll be useful in the future if I have an opportunity to go uh, on a, a short-term missions trip or something like that and be able to use some of that content. So yeah, it's the content on my, on my channels is primarily Reformed theology. Uh, a lot of it has to do with Machen because he's uh, the, the theologian that I'm most interested in studying for the last uh, few years, uh, but also other stuff, uh, stuff related to church history uh, that interests me as well as uh, catechizing children, obviously something that, that I'm uh, deeply involved in right now. So that's kind of the, the general gist of it. Most of the content on the two channels is identical. Uh, there are some things that I'll put only on English or only on Spanish, but for the most part, when I create a video, I'll do one in English and then do another run uh, right afterwards in Spanish. 
Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I could be misremembering this, but are you not also doing some translation work of some written projects too? Are you putting some things that were in English into Spanish or vice versa, or am I, mis or am I making that up? I've done a little bit of that. Uh, for the most part though, uh, being a native, English, a native English speaker, it's a lot easier for me to, to take stuff from Spanish into English. Uh, and unfortunately there isn't that much reformed theology uh, written in Spanish originally yet. So uh, I haven't had, I don't do that too much. I do it uh, to some extent for work, uh, but, but I haven't done too much uh, translating recently. So the world is awaiting some great Spanish speaking theologians to come onto the scene and give yep. us some amazing works that the world needs to hear. That would be awesome. So yep. you mentioned Machen. Now let's talk about him for just a second here. And I probably fell into the age old trap of mispronouncing his name. So give us, <laughs> if you can, the definitive pronunciation on JGM's name. How, how are we supposed to say this, <laughs> right. Daniel? Yeah, and so this is actually something that uh, Machen himself had to clarify. He wrote he wrote this in uh, in one of his writings. He he specifically said, "Here's how you pronounce my name." Uh, so his first name is John. Uh, hardly ever uses it. Uh, of course, that's the easiest of the names you to uh, to pronounce. Uh, Gresham is how you pronounce his his middle name or the name that he went by most. Um, if you think about the, you, you want to split the S and the H. It, it's kind of misleading, but the in, in English, an S and an H together, uh, you normally want to pronounce that as the sh sound. But uh, in his name, those they're two different syllables. So Gresham uh, is how to pronounce that. And so then, of course, we were, yeah. if we were walking down the street and we saw him, uh, we passed him on the way and we said, hey, Mr. Machen, would you call him? Uh, J or Gresham or doctor or professor? What do you think? What do you think people called him? I think uh, there, he had a number of nicknames. Um, to, so depending on how you knew him and, and so forth, uh, I think that would uh, that would impact it. Uh, but but I think typically his his peers would have like would have likely called him Gresham. All right, cool. So um, let's get into like, what's, so why is this guy important? Give us, um, first of all, how you got personally pulled into mm -hmm. studying his works. And then maybe you could kind of transition then into wh like, what's, give us some of his background and uh, his history as to why he's an important figure for us. Yeah. So the, the way I got uh, interested in, in Machen, or at least how I learned about him, uh, was through, as most people, I think, uh, was through his book, Christianity and Liberalism. That's the book he's best known for. Uh, and it's one of those books, even in a, in a non-denominational church as a kid, there was a copy of the book on the shelf in the library. Uh, so uh, something vaguely aware of his existence for a long time, didn't read Christianity and Liberalism until later, I want to say college or so. Um, and was just really impressed by the 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 his ability to to communicate clearly uh, his his amazing breadth of knowledge uh, and his direct style very readable uh, doesn't doesn't have a lot of flowery language doesn't have paragraph after paragraph of kind of filler material it's just just punch after punch after punch uh, as you're reading his book. Great, great points. Uh, so that really was the the way I got into uh, reading uh, Machen in the first place. And uh, the the content of the book uh, in and of itself is is great. But then as you really start to understand who the guy is, he becomes even more compelling. Um, and so thinking about uh, some of the, uh, the, the important aspects of his life, uh, he's born in 1881. Uh, and so, so a little over, you know, a little over 130 years ago or so, and he's, um, I guess now 140, right? 140 years ago. And so he's, uh, grows up in a Presbyterian household, learns the shorter catechism, all that stuff. But then he really struggles with his faith when he's older mm -hmm. and, and also with, uh, generally with, uh, the, his, what he's going to do with his life. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't want to go into ministry, uh, but ultimately he decides to, to do that. And so he's very relatable in that sense. It's like a lot of a lot of young young men, uh, young people in general, have those kinds of have those kinds of struggles in in their youth. And but he comes out of it uh, studying hard, learning from some of the some of the best 
uh, scholars out there, both on the conservative or orthodox side, as well as some who, who deny a lot of the key doctrines of the Bible, learning from both sides and ultimately coming to the conclusion that uh, Christianity is the real deal. And then, uh, so he, and he, and he's throughout his life, he's, he's, he's obviously a fighter. And you really get to see that as he gets older and gets more involved in these uh, debates, particularly the fundamentalist modernist controversy uh, in the 1920s. He's a key player there. And that's the context in which Christianity and liberal, liberalism is published. And, uh, and eventually uh, the, the, the fundamentalists or the conservatives in that, in that controversy lose. Um, and Machen is forced out of his, his professorship at a prominent seminary and says, okay, I'm going to go found a new seminary. So he, from scratch, he starts Westminster Seminary with some, you know, other help, other people are involved too, but he's clearly the figurehead. And he continues to fight the, the, the good fight in his denomination until he feels like, um, well, in, in that case, he, he couldn't, he didn't, they didn't really give him an option. He, he was eventually excommunicated in 1936 uh, from the denomination and he founded uh, what is now known as the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. So mm -hmm. one of the, um, again, another institution that continues to, to exist today. So his life, uh, you know, he, he wasn't a typical uh, I, I shouldn't say typical. He wasn't a, a, a theologian who just sat around in the ivory tower all the time, writing, writing books constantly. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was much more like, uh, like a lot of the theologians that we admire, like Edwards, for example, who's, who was obviously very involved in, in ministry. Uh, Machen was, Machen was a churchman and he was, uh, he was heavily involved in, in a lot of things consumed his time that were not just pumping out more theology books. Uh, but the books that he did write uh, are uh, are excellent too. Now, um, I think of him as being a colleague and associate of Gerhardus Voss and some other guys. Who who were some of the other? Um, not to trivia question you here, but who were some of the other guys that are kind of uh, his his peers, his contemporaries in the nineteen twenties and thirties? Yeah, so he kind of hits this generational. Um, transition. So B.B. Warfield was on, uh, was at Princeton Seminary when Machen joined uh, sem uh, at Princeton. And so, and Warfield, obviously the, the, one of the great uh, Presbyterian theologians at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and, but he continues on into, obviously lives until early 20th century and is on uh, with Machen for a brief period before he dies. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the, so Machen is kind of this is very young at the time that that Warfield dies, uh, but he's and but then a lot of his peers at Princeton stayed there, and they're not as well known uh, as as Warfield and Machen are. Uh, one of them's one of the I guess it was the grandson. Casper Wister Hodge is the grandson of of Charles Hodge, uh, so they would have been they would have been peers. Um, and then uh, following Machen to uh, to Westminster. Uh, you had uh, Ned Stonehouse, mm -hmm. uh, who's pretty well known in at least in the OPC, um, and um, and he wrote he wrote a, a biography of Machen that's that's quite helpful. Uh, and then you've got oh, and I'm blanking on his name, uh, our, uh, the presuppositionalist apologist uh, Van Til. Van mm -hmm. Til, uh, Machen uh, worked hard to get Van Til to. Uh, come out of the the the, the uh, Reformed Church and come to the Presbyterian Church to work in uh, Westminster Seminary with him. So a lot of these names that we're throwing around, we may be familiar with if we are Presbyterian or if we're Reformed. Um, you and I, we go to a PCA church. We're part of Ascension Presbytery, and uh, many of the OPC viewers out there, if there are many OPC viewers to this channel, uh, will no doubt recognize those names, but. Nathaniel, do you think that Machen has any kind of appeal to the broader evangelical world? In other words, I mean, clearly we can we can point to him as a seminal figure in our tradition, but mm -hmm. how do you think other evangelicals view Machen? Is he relevant to them as he is to us? Yeah, I mean, maybe not, you know, maybe not quite as relevant. Uh, a lot of Machen's writings, uh, at least a fair amount of them are 
tailored a little bit more towards uh, Presbyterianism, uh, but the vast majority, I would say, of his of his material is is accessible and very useful to evangelicals generally. So uh, Christianity and liberalism, he is very focused on the core doctrines of Christianity. Uh, and there's a little section in it in which he's kind of talking about denominational differences, but uh, he, his point is that all of us on the evangelical side are very close to each other, uh, and the and we all agree on these essentials that that he tries to defend in that in that book. Uh, his some of his scholarly works, the origin of Paul's religion and the virgin birth of Christ, both are are immensely helpful for apologetics generally mm -hmm. for anybody that is trying to uh, defend the 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 inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. Um, other books of his that he wrote uh, will they are they'll they'll be generally evangelical, uh, but have a little bit more of a of a reformed uh, a reformed focus to them. So he's got a few books uh, that were published that consist of a series of radio lectures that he did uh, that are presenting systematic theology from a reformed perspective, but doing so in a way that is accessible to a broad audience since he was, he was on the, he was on the radio talking to uh, talking to anybody who would listen basically. So it's not just um, niche Presbyterian theology that Machen is working from uh, much of what he's doing is basic evangelical high view of scripture, uh, Orthodox Christianity. And I yeah. think you mentioned the work on the virgin birth. I do commend that to anybody who's interested in a study on the virgin birth of Christ, especially remember this around Christmas time, because if you're looking for, if you're a pastor and you're looking for some good material to, to work through uh, some of those issues, then that, that may be the book that, that you want to yeah. go to. Yep. Um, but Christianity and liberalism is probably his best known work, don't you think, Nathaniel? And yeah. one that oh, yeah. you've uh, one that you've spent quite a bit of time reading yourself. Mm -hmm. You want to tell us a little bit about the over uh, the overview and how to, how that book flows? Yeah, uh, and this is an, an example. So you've got there are actually two publications: World Magazine, uh, evangelical, obviously, and then Christianity Today, also uh, pretty evangelical. Both of which very highly regard this book. So it's another testament to the, uh, to the, 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 the broad appeal of, of Machen's writing and particularly this book, Christianity and Liberalism. Um, probably important to, to call out at the beginning. And one of the things that I didn't realize at first, uh, liberalism in the book's title does not refer to politics. So if you're mm -hmm. concerned about reading something about politics, it's very little political stuff you'll even detect in the, in that book. Um, it refers instead to uh, theological liberalism or modernism, mm -hmm. which is essentially this, this belief that was uh, gaining a lot of traction in his day and continues to have a lot of traction now that basically says that the supernatural uh, is, doesn't exist. There is no, there is no supernatural. Uh, and the way that that works itself out uh, in in uh, in Christianity, we, we uh, as as the as the liberals of that day uh, attempted to do, they would say things like, uh, "We don't believe in a in a real physical bodily resurrection of Jesus, uh, but he lives in our hearts." Uh, that kind of thing, or mm -hmm. uh, we don't uh, we don't believe that the that the Bible was was inspired by God, but it it contains the uh, it contains eternal truths uh, that that really that really uh, are, are valuable for for Christians to follow, and so there would be this kind of anti supernatural uh, faction in the church uh, in the Presbyterian Church at the time, uh, and Machen was having none of it. He wanted he wanted to defend the orthodox uh, historic Christianity that Jesus really did rise from the dead, uh, that the Bible is inspired. Uh, by God and is inerrant, um, and uh, and and other fundamental uh, central doctrines uh, along those lines, mm -hmm. and that's what the book focuses on. He he makes a a, a general argument that uh, Christianity is based on history. You can't have Christianity without doctrine. You can't mm -hmm. have Christianity uh, without history and the interpretation of history, specifically the history of the the birth life 
uh, suffering, death, uh, resurrection of Jesus. If you don't have uh, those things firmly uh, at the base of your religion, then you don't have Christianity at all. At all. And that's, that's the argument of Christianity and liberalism, that the liberals who attempt to sidestep those doctrines are, are in fact not Christians, even though they use uh, their, even though they use a lot of Christian terminology, they're still preaching on Sundays. They're still uh, talking about Jesus. They're still talking about um, uh, being good people and stuff like that. Uh, but they're not, they're not, uh, they're not actually following Christianity. They're not teaching Christianity because they're not teaching uh, that Jesus died on the cross for people's sins, atoned for their sins mm -hmm. and, and rose from the dead. Yeah, and not only that, but uh, two things that strike me from reading the book, and by the way, um, Nathaniel led an amazing Bible study for our church on uh, on Zoom back during the, the pandemic times when we were doing things online a lot more, uh, but two things that struck me about the book, reading it again, and I had read it a few years ago, is first that um, Machen does not believe that liberalism is just another perspective on Christianity or um, a denominational nuance, but he actually believes that liberalism is an entirely different religion because it operates from completely different premises and arrives at a completely different conclusion. So uh, he's not saying that this, is, look, there's a several views of Christianity. They're all probably legitimate. No, he's actually arguing that liberalism is a, is a different religion entirely. Isn't that right? Yep, exactly. Yep. And then the other thing that kind of struck me is reading through the book again is how Machen is suggesting that um, some of the liberals of his time were actually acting duplicitously. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, they weren't being really honest about what they believed when they were coming up through the ranks to be ordained or to be installed as pastors or professors of various mm -hmm. seminaries. But in some cases, they're affirming the language of the confessions and the creeds but they're kind of holding back mental reservation and affirming something else in their hearts, even as they're saying the right words. And so, you know, uh, one of the problems that he's addressing is when, when we say resurrection, for instance, we are, we are, we are indicating that a dead body got out of a grave yep. and our people in our pews, when they hear us say resurrection, they think we're talking about a dead body getting out of a grave. And unfortunately, what, what he's perceiving is that some people are using that word differently. They're talking about uh, maybe a feeling that comes over uh, a person or a spirit of positive motivation or positive feeling that, you know, that um, th they have a different understanding and they're doing that duplicitously and on purpose. Yep. But what do you think, Nathaniel, about his contention that some of the progressives of his day were, were acting uh, with sleight of hand, as it were? I think it's it's very compelling. Uh, you read something like uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick's "Shall the Fundamentalists Win?" This is a a liberal Baptist um, uh, pastor, and he's he's attacking the fundamentalists or the people that, that believe in the uh, at the time fundamentalist didn't have the connotation it does now. Um, because of the because of the concept of fundamentalists in the 60s and 70s uh, but mm -hmm. but at the time fundamentalist was more uh, more meaning the just people that defended the the orthodox doctrines of christianity and yeah you read something like fosdick um, some of the other liberals they, they will be very hesitant to uh, use specific language and Machen calls out a number of different examples of that as he goes through the book. Uh, and it's not just in that book, it's all through his writings in, in many of his writings. Uh, you'll see, you'll see him mentioning this, this problem of deceit and, you know, maybe in some churches you might say, well, what's it's maybe it's not that big of a deal or uh, it's um what the pastor believes is, is more the, the church's responsibility. So what's the big deal about him, about, uh, about this, this language thing. And the big difference is that in Presbyterian church that Machen was part of this denomination, uh, you're expected to, to uh, subscribe to the Westminster standards, the mm -hmm. Westminster confession of faith, the shorter and larger catechisms. And mm -hmm. if, if you're going to stand up there and say, Oh yeah, I believe in the, the I, I subscribe to the confession of faith, but then you're going to, uh, then you're going to talk to somebody a day later and say, 
uh, Jesus is, is Jesus, was Jesus really God? Uh, you know, you know, that's, that kind of thing is, uh, is obviously a problem. It's, it's deceitful to, to go before a Presbyterian and say, yeah, I believe in, in the Westminster standards. I subscribe to those. And then the next day be talking about doubts that you have, uh, about, uh, or not even just doubts, but, but clear, uh, a rejection of some of the core doctrines of those, of those documents. So um, some of the viewers might be interested in uh, reading some of Machen's stuff. Do you mm -hmm. have any particular recommendations of where they should get started? I mean, we've mentioned Christianity and liberalism a few times. I'll yep. try to post a link in the description of the video so you can go grab that particular book. Is there anything else or any additions of, the, uh, of Christianity and liberalism that people should be aware of? Other things we need to read as well? Yeah, so Christianity and liberalism is definitely the place to start. Um, it's still quite easy to read, even though it was a published coming up on 100 years ago. There, he does make some uh, some reference to the the current the, the contemporary debates at the time. So there can be places in in that book where um, you might not catch everything, and that's one of the things I'm hoping to do in my channel over the next uh, in the, over the coming months is is go through each chapter and, and talk about some of the difficult things uh, within each chapter that a modern reader might not get. Uh, but, but that shouldn't, you know, that, that shouldn't uh, prevent you from starting to read it right now. It's, it's quite readable. 99% uh, of his points are, are right out there in the open and, uh, and it's, it's compelling. Um, other stuff to read. I mean, you could really read uh, there's there's so much uh, the the apologetic stuff is great as as mentioned um, uh, specific uh, particularly virgin birth uh, that was what he considered to be his best work mm -hmm. uh, or or at least his most important work mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> he wrote a sub a, kind of a sequel to Christianity and liberalism called what is faith which is also very useful because it it focuses uh, very much on the idea of uh, faith being something that is rooted in knowledge, uh, rooted in the intellect, that it's not, it, it's not just a, this experience or something like that. It's, it, it has experiential components to it, of course, but it's not just, uh, this thing that you can have without engaging your brain. So, uh, yeah. that's also a valuable, a valuable work to read after, after Christianity and liberalism. Um, wrote a lot of short essays, many yeah, of which a whole book of short essays, yeah. I believe if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, was it, uh, yeah. So there's, there's, well, there's several, um, the, the biggest one, the best one probably is D, uh, D G hearts, uh, selected shorter writings. Yeah. Uh, that's very good. Got a lot of uh, great material in there. Uh, there's a collection of his sermons called God transcendent, which is, which has some good material in it. Uh, but if, but other than the, than those first few books, I mentioned Christianity, and liberalism, what is faith? If you're ambitious, the the apologetic stuff those are those are much more scholarly and in depth. Um, the other stuff that he did for the for kind of the the, the general reader uh, would be uh, this series, that systematic theology series that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, I'm going to forget the names. I think it's Christianity in modern culture uh, was one. Christianity and the view of man, or the Christian view of man, I think is the second one. Uh, unfortunately he died, uh, before being able to complete that series. So it stops the, the series stops, uh, with when he's, when he's just getting to the atonement. Um, mm -hmm. so we don't get a lot of Christology, a lot of, uh, salvation and so forth. Uh, but, but still they're very readable, uh, introductions to, uh, evangelical reformed theology that, uh, that, that continue to be, uh, highly regarded. I think in a recent publication of those, I think Tim Keller's on the back mm -hmm. uh, uh, talking about how, how useful these, these books are. So uh, there is a, there's a lot of good material that he wrote in his short life. He only lived to be 55 or so. Um, and despite all the other, all the other stuff he's doing, I don't know how he, I don't know how he did it all, but, but somehow he managed to, uh, to, to do that. Well, Nathaniel, thank you so much for joining us today for this uh, this interview. I do hope that viewers will go check out your channel. Don't forget uh, that Nathaniel does some stuff in English and he also does some stuff in Spanish. And you might especially consider sharing that Spanish channel if you know any brothers or sisters in Christ around the world that uh, that speaks Spanish and or English. 
Um, and I do want to also th say thank you so much, Nathaniel. You are an amazing ruling elder to work with. You know, just to brag on Presbyterianism here just for a second, um, one of my real blessings and joys is that I get to be surrounded by uh, not just one Nathaniel Sheets, but there's 12 of us that meet at the table, every man uh, with his own uh, love for the Lord and a mind ready to serve Christ and discern the will of God for our local church here, Gospel Fellowship PCA. So, you never feel alone when you're a Presbyterian pastor because you're not alone. And if things go well, it's because we've shared the burden of leading the church together and because God is, is good and gracious to his church. And when things go awry, uh, we can look at each other and uh, lick our wounds and, um, you know, encourage each other and pick ourselves up and try again the next time because we're all in it together. And that's one reason why I love the Presbyterian church. I, as a pastor, I'm not out there slogging away on my own out there in the middle of a field alone, but I do feel like I have a band of brothers with me. And this is one of my guys right here, Nathaniel Sheets. So thank you so much for joining us. I want to say thank you so much for uh, everybody who stopped in to watch this interview. Do love you lots and we'll talk to you later. Thank you.